Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Peter. Peter, for everyone out there listening who might not know who you are, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Peter Driscoll. I'm a staff scientist at uh, Carnegie Science Earth and Planets Lab. And what particularly do you focus in, Peter? I'm a geophysicist that studies the Earth's deep interior, and I also work a little bit on exoplanets and magnetic field evolution. So which one would you like to talk about first? I know I'm very knowledgeable in the exoplanets aspect, but when we talk about the deep interior of the Earth, besides me being able to say that there's lava in there, like that's all I can really go to. I think that's like the general public. You're taught like a really kind of uh, a, a quick run through of uh, in science class about what the Earth is made of. And then there's not really a deeper dive into it. But I feel like it's honestly probably more. Uh, information uh, way deeper, like more secrets and more interesting stuff about it that a lot of the public probably doesn't know about. Yeah, first, I mean, I hope you don't mind me correct, correcting a few things you said there, like the la lava is a colloquial term for magma that's erupted to the surface. So we actually don't have lava in the interior. We have magma, magma. in the interior. That's a minor, it's a certain, you know, that's a, it's a word thing. Um, and now I, you know, I, it is interesting that I went through school, uh, you know, grade school and then college, not learning much of anything about the Earth's interior. I mean, partly because it's hard to learn about, it's because you can't see it, and it's very hard to like sample at any depth, um, but it's really not taught very much. So that's, you know, one first point to make is that I always tell, I, whenever anyone's listening that has power, I would say that we should be teaching Earth science um, and deep interiors and what's going on in the Earth's interior at a, at a lot longer, you know, educational baseline, not just in grad school or whatever, because student physics students in particular can learn a lot just from studying how the Earth is layered and how it's cooling over time. And it's easy to motivate that kind of education because we think the evolution of the Earth's interior is really central to the story of the Earth and how life has evolved and stayed, the Earth has stayed habitable. Uh, for as long as it has. And so when people start talking about exoplanets, I always say the place to start is absolutely the Earth. I mean, we definitely do not understand everything there is to know about the Earth, of course. We don't exactly know why Earth has life, other planets don't. We don't know why it's been habitable for so long. We don't even really know what that word means in a broader sense. So when we start people talk, talking about exoplanets, start thinking about, we start with, is it an Earth-like exoplanet? Because we have some knowledge of what Earth is like. And then other kinds of exoplanets is really more speculation. Other types of habitability, different compositions and sizes of planets that really starting to get out there in the, uh, you know, aspect of just trying to take informed guesses. It's something we need to do, be doing because the general public is so interested in that topic. You know, where's Earth point to? 2.0, sorry. Um, so I've been pushing, you know, that that you know the exoplanet community invest a little bit more into studying interiors because I realize it's very hard to do, but it is super important for controlling the evolution of the planet. When it comes to the interior, maybe some interesting information that you feel like a lot of people probably don't know about that could actually spark interest in people actually diving deeper into the topic. You know, you mentioned that you should feel like this should be taught a little bit more, especially would help out like with people who are interested in physics. Um, I learned that from talking to someone about crater impacts, that there's actually a large importance of studying those, which it just seems like you're just studying kind of like holes in a rock in a sense, but it's like, no, you're actually pulling a lot of crucial information about it. I mean, even with the earth and how this planet is somehow this miraculous thing that can sustain life. Now we can point to like basic features when it comes to water and sunlight. I think everybody could give that response, but it seems like there's more. I don't know if it's, it's to me, it just seems like this is like a stroke of luck. Like the fact that this planet happens to be the one that does all these amazing things that's 
pr that promotes our growth. But I mean, there's so much other aspects besides humans that it also helps with. It's with plants, it's with other animals as well too. It's been this main thing that is like the the focal point of sustaining life that we know of. Now, if you talk about exoplanets, we look for something that would be good for our life, like oxygen quality, uh, sustainable conditions, similar to Earth's conditions. But even when you dive into like intelligent life, that big question out there, I mean, it only what qualities or standards of life are we talking about? Are we talking about the ones that fit our categories? Or are we talking about the ones that would fit maybe something else that could survive off little oxygen that could survive off a whole different quality of traits? You know, nobody wants to live on like an ice planet because you like what you like. You like living at the beach. You like drinking martinis or something like that. I don't know. But people- well, some people might like ice planets on that. I mean, I, 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 I don't like the cold that much. I mean, it's all right. Sometimes on like a, on a hot day, but um, it's, it's interesting because I think, especially um, I remember talking to Stephen Kane on here who studies exoplanets as well too. And like Venus, for instance, and he's mentioning a bunch of other planets that before it was, it seemed like these weren't going to be things that we could actually live on. But also I think with the advancement of technology and our better understanding of these planets, we're finding ways to make these planets a more suitable condition for human life, where you've seen the scale of exoplanets exoplanets go from a very small number maybe 50 something years ago to where we're at now where there's like i think they're talking about way more exoplanets than there were before yeah there's like five thousand. jeez i thought i was, I was gonna say a hundred thank god five thousand ish well some of them are objects of interest and they're they're implied to or they're assumed to be planets because that's the easiest description of the data but um yeah well there's a lot in there in your question i guess just to bring it back to the interior, or, or I'll bring it back more generally to what makes planets habitable. Some general statements we can make about what makes planets habitable are, are as I said before, mainly about the Earth. So we know that the Earth has had um, a magnetic field for f about four, four and a half billion years. We know the Earth maintains plate tectonics. So that's the movement, slow movement of uh, the crust over time that helps recycle um, gases and volatiles and water between the surface and the interior over time, which has a nice buffering effect in the climate. It's called the, the CO2 cycle. Um, and no other planet we know has that. Earth has uh, a large liquid water reservoir, obviously. No other planet we know has that on a rocky surface. Um, and then, of course, the, the fourth one being the Earth's had life for, you know, we think about three billion years, and no planet we know of has that. Now, it's 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 pot. It's still possible that there are microscopic organisms living underneath the ice shell on Europa or Enceladus or the lakes of Titan or something, um, something really exotic. It's possible. But it's not, that's not the same scale of life that the Earth has maintained. I mean, that's a definitive statement we can all agree on. Like, Earth is, is completely covered with life. Life is footprint is everywhere. It influences the atmospheric composition. Some people think that the Earth itself is like an organism, which is a bit out there, but that's called the Gaia theory. Mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of philosophical aspects to that. So when we think about habitability, um, the place I always start is those, is those three pillars, and then you have life as the fourth as the outcome. So a magnetic field, plate tectonics, liquid water on the surface. Those, those are the three things. So we start thinking about, as theorists, how do we understand where these things come from, how stable they are? The questions are, how do you maintain a magnetic field for that long? How do you maintain plate tectonics for that long? And how do you, you know, retain your liquid water on the surface so that it doesn't, is not lost to space? For example, we know Venus has lost a significant amount of uh, H2O, or mainly H, to space over time. Um, and so maybe Venus was born with a similar water budget, but for whatever reason lost its water to space over time. One of those reasons could be it's closer to the sun. It, it's too hot and therefore the water kind of remains in the atmosphere. That's called a runaway greenhouse. And then the water can just escape to space, uh, perhaps because it has no magnetic field. Venus has no magnetic field today. And that could be important for shielding 
uh, the upper atmosphere, the hydrogen from escaping early on. Um, and plate tectonics, we got, you know, there's no other planet that has plate tectonics. Um, that could be because no other planet has liquid water. We think liquid water is important for the getting the real rheology right uh, in the crustal rocks so that they can keep moving. You can have melting at depth, um, and vol you can bring in volatiles back into the interior, which helps maintain uh, plate tectonics over the long run. So, plate, what causes plate tectonics and why it's maintained over a long time is one of the big outstanding questions in all of Earth science that we still don't have a really great answer to. And so until we get better understanding of some of these Earth-specific problems, um, it's going to be hard to generalize to exoplanets. I guess that's kind of a pessimistic thing to say. But I'm just trying to ground the general public in where, this, where the scientists, where the debates are from the, on the, from the scientist's perspective on like looking for the next Earth. I respect that because um, I think a lot of ideas get tossed into technology leading us to space colonization. And that's cool and all to talk about. Um, but in reality, I kind of look on the basis of uh, there's still a lot of secrets here that we need to understand before. I don't honestly think we're ready to even travel really out into space and start colonizing or the idea of colonizing on other planets. Now, other people might have differing opinions, but I feel like you got to make sure that, you know, all your your uh, T's are crossed and all your I's are dotted in a sense before you, you know, you leave your only home or the one that you were originally born on, I would say. Um, but when it comes to like the plate or not plate tectonics, but like the the magnetic um, shield that's kind of around us in a sense. Do, do they have any possible theories or do you have any ideas of why that there is this thing and how beneficial it is for us? Like, I understand if we lose it, it can have some crucial damage to us, but what's keeping it intact? Is it a thing of resources? Is it, um, how did that even occur? How did this planet originally just have this type of shield? That's the question is what, well, we know magnetic fields are generated deep in the interiors of planets. So you have to have a conducting liquid, like a metal, like a liquid metal, and it has to be moving, so swirling in some way, or convecting is normally what we call it. You can think of convecting like boiling water on a stove, except in this case, in the Earth's liquid outer core, you have liquid metal that's convecting. Uh, so the liquid's moving around and generating a magnetic field via current, just a current loop going on in the liquid metal as it's convecting. And that generates a, law, a large scale magnetic field that penetrates through the rocky mantle all the way up into space. In fact, the solar wind balances the Earth's magnetic field out way out into space at about 10 Earth radii away from the surface of the Earth. And that's called the magnetopause. So that's the first uh, barrier between the Earth and the solar wind environment. And it's way out there, like I said, at 10 Earth radii. So what goes on in the center of the planet influences what, what's going on 10 Earth radii away, which is pretty fabulous to think about. So what, so first of all, Earth has a magnetic field, Venus doesn't, all the other planets in the solar system do, or have evidence of ha had one in the past. Mercury has an active magnetic field today generated in its core. Um, Venus has no evidence. Earth has had one for at least 4 billion years. The moon, and Mars both have crustal rem magnetic remnants that implies that they used to have a magnetic field when they were younger that then died at some point, which we don't understand exactly why. There's a lot of people working on that problem. And then Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune all have magnetic fields, but they're generated not in liquid iron, but in some other metallized uh, gaseous form for you know hydrogen at high pressure becomes metallic in the sense that it becomes electrically conducting. So um, they're, they're a bit more unique. They're distinct from the rocky planet cores. So we, we think magnetic fields, we know magnetic fields are actually ubiquitous when it comes to planets. Um, it's a mystery why some planets, rocky planets maintain them like Mercury and Earth for 4 billion years. Well, we think Mercury's has been that old. We don't have any good evidence. Um, and why on Mars and the Moon and Venus, they don't have magnetic fields today. And it has to do with generating that magnetic field occurs by this fluid motion, as I mentioned earlier. And that fluid motion is driven by pulling heat out of the planet. So just cooling the planet. And if you can cool the planet fast enough, then that heat 
that's being pulled out of the planet's interior is going to drive fluid motion in the interior. And that's how you drive the convection. So the trick is to cool the interiors of these planets fast enough to keep the fluid motion going to generate a magnetic field. But if you cool the interior too fast, you can get into a problem where you solidify the liquid iron to, to a solid iron ball in the interior, which could be what happened on the moon, for example. So there's a little bit of a Goldilocks paradox, uh, paradox there of, you know, the classic Goldilocks zone is you want your habitable planet to be close enough to the sun to have liquid water, but not too close to have it, all the water evaporate, right? Uh, and it's similar for planetary interior, the, the cores and the magnetic fields where you want to cool the interior fast enough to make the fluid move and generate a magnetic field, but not too fast to freeze it all out. So um, understanding why the earth is right in that Goldilocks zone and maybe Mercury um, is a complicated thing. And it depends, of course, not only just on the cooling rate of the planet, but its composition. So, you know, unfortunately, the detailed composition of the core plays a big role in determining how the fluid moves, how it may, at what rate it may solidify once it starts solidifying, and how easy it is to convect, and how well it conducts a magnetic field, and all these things. So it's the physics and the chemistry. You've really got to bring them both together. Now, is there something that could happen where it could throw off that kind of, uh, I would say, mixture or that effect that's happening in our our, our Earth right now? Like, uh, I'm not saying something as similar as like I don't know, throwing trash out your window, but I'm saying is there some type of uh, things that could be a possibility of throwing this thing off balance to a point where you start seeing like, because I mean, if you look at the ex uh, examples of like the ones that have a shield and the ones that don't have this shield, and you look at those planets, I mean, it just seemed like their main generator shut off. And then this is what happens when you, th the power goes out, like eventually everything just kind of starts to die in a sense. Yeah, it's a good way to think about it. So the, the power you're supplying, like I said, is pulling heat out and that's driving fluid flow. So if you stopped cooling the planet, so say Earth, um, instead of having plate tectonics on its surface, um, it had a stagnant lid like Venus. So a stagnant lid is where you've got a single crust over the planet and there's no subduction of the crust down into the interior. And that's actually a very poor way of cooling the interior. It's like wrapping a blanket around the mantle. And then all this heat has to diffuse very slowly. So for Venus, it could be the, the fact that it has a stagnant lid that keeps the, the interior from cooling, prevents the interior from cooling, which is what's preventing the iron from convecting in Venus's core. So if the Earth ever went into that kind of scenario where we with plate tectonics died or slowed down, then the cooling rate of Earth's deep interior would go down and that could kill the dynamo. There's actually um, one of my uh, research fields is in investigating when the inner Earth's inner core first solidified. So the, inside the liquid iron outer core, there's a solid iron inner core that's growing from the bottom out very slowly. It's currently about a third of the size of the core by radius. Um, and if you go back in time, imagine going back in time, the core was getting hotter and hotter as you go back in time because it started in a very hot state that inner core would melt and get smaller and smaller until it would be gone, it would be all liquid. And we expect that when that inner core first solidified, there to be a big influence on the Earth's magnetic field on the surface. And we've got rocks going back through the whole geologic record telling us what the magnetic field is doing in the, in the center of the planet. So one outstanding question is, where is this magnetic signature of inner core solidification? And we don't see it. But uh, my prediction is that the, um, that the, the dynamo, the Earth's magnetic field came close to dying around 600, 700 million years ago during the Ediacaran period. Um, and then right around that time, the Earth's inner core nucleated, which gave it a big burst of energy. And that's what saved the dynamo from dying completely. And there's some magnetic evidence in the rock record that agrees with that prediction. And folks now are going back out into the field to look at old, these old rocks from the Neo-Proterozoic era. Uh, that's 500 million to a billion years ago. 
to try and tease out what was the magnetic field doing at that time and is my prediction consistent with an inner core that's that age and now people have even taken it to the next level of could that have influenced um life on on the earth's surface because there is a big cambrian explosion 500 million years ago where you know life came out of the oceans and became much more complex and so some people have proposed that that's driven by the magnetic field recovering but for me that's way too early to speculate about that and the the paleontologists i've talked to don't buy that idea for their own reasons that i couldn't couldn't uh, explain so it's the there are there is the potential to have the connection between these things you have to be careful about drawing these big connections between the interior and evolution of life um, but um yeah that's a good example of how the the, the life of the magnetic field could influence life on the surface i know some of the theories i've heard about like life being on here like people saying we come from mars from like some particles that floated off into our atmosphere and they were uh, like it's like adding something to like i don't know some soil yeah. Yeah, but yeah. there's, I mean, there's a lot of theories about it. Um, I, for me, I think it's all fascinating because I mean, it is a interesting topic when you look at the the fact that there's just this one planet that that we know of that has this uh, abundance of life in a sense. But if we talk about the core and like it going to this like nuclear point where it kind of like it implodes on itself, but it kind of like bursts out more heat. Now, yeah. Inner core, it's, it first starts to solidify, we call that a nucleation event. It's not imploding, it's just that the, the liquid at the center of the core got cold enough to solidify. And then it starts to solidify and it grows and grows and grows. So it's like growing an ice cube. Imagine you've got a ball of water, or a spherical ball of water, and you cool it down, and the ice cube first nucleates in the center and it grows from the inside out. That's what we think happened to the core. So is that an un like unexpected occurrence, or is it just these periods of over a vast amount of time where it has like these resets in a set? So it it's, is it's just a slow cooling of the interior. Once you get that temperature at the center of the Earth down to a certain point, maybe fifty five hundred Kelvin or six thousand Kelvin, that's the temperature when iron will start to solidify at that pressure, which is very high pressure. And it could happen in other planets. So we, we think Mercury has a large inner core and a little liquid outer core, iron outer core. Um, Mars, so that's for Mercury. For Mars, we don't know. For the Moon, we're not sure. For Venus, we don't know either. Um, but at least for Mercury, we think it also has an inner core that's growing slowly over time. So if that occurred and then we see life kind of happen after that like for us for instance is it possible that if you look at another planet and maybe they went through something similar that it, they just didn't have the i guess the resilience to build back life or build life it just didn't have that outcome like it was kind of a rare chance that we did well it could be that the um the evolutionary trajectory that set mammals off in the cambrian explosion could have been influenced by the magnetic field, I would say. So it's not that we needed it to have life at all. I mean, life, complex life was quite happy under the oceans during that time. And the idea that's been floated is that, is that without a strong magnetic field or magnetic shield, if you want, that solar radiation was, was raining down on the surface of the earth much more than it is today which could be bad for uh, life forms constantly getting irradiated whenever there's a solar flare or something like that. So this is getting in more into biology than I'm familiar with, but that's the general idea that, you know, this magnetic shield provides a nice um, habitable surface environment by shielding out this harmful radiation. Now, is there a certain element besides just like if you look at the core, but are there certain elements that other planets have that might help out with like this mag uh, this magnetic uh, field, for instance? Like, is it just the core and its own is the one we can pinpoint to? Or are there other certain aspects of a, a planet or um, maybe something else out in space, another uh, planet out there that has these certain similar materials or certain similar metals, not just in the core, but other aspects, maybe about its layer or something that apply an effect. Like, I feel like that has to add something on there. Absolutely. That's a good question. Yes. I mean, the cooling rate of the core is determined by the mantle above it. So the mantle is this big rocky layer. 
uh, most of the mass of the earth is in the mantle. And the mantle is highly viscous. It, even though it's a solid, it undergoes convection. So it behaves like a fluid over long time scales, believe it or not, kind of like glass. If you see an old glass window, you can see it kind of dripping or drooping. Um, and we think of glass as being a solid, but it undergoes solid state convection over long periods of time. And that's the same thing that's going on in the mantle. But it, because it's so slow to convect and it's such a poor conductor of heat, the mantle gets, loses its heat very slowly. Okay, if the core was exposed directly to space, it would cool very fast, but it's not. It's, it's trapped beneath this rocky mantle. And it's really that rocky mantle that determines the cooling rate of the deep interior. And as I said, the mantle cooling rate is influenced by whether it has plate tectonics on the surface or a stagnant lid. And, and, it, you know, and, and it's also influenced by what is the composition of the mantle. Uh, how easy is it to melt the mantle and erupt heat under the surface, which can cool the interior. So there's a lot of factors. Uh, the, the big factors when we talk about exoplanets would be also be heat sources. So how much radiogenic heat is there? So this is radio, radiogenic elements in the mantle that are just de freely decaying over long time scales and releasing enormous amounts of heat, um, believe it or not, just because there's so much mass in the Earth's mantle. So the, the primary radiogenic elements are uranium, potassium, and thorium. And they decay over billions of years and they release, um, we, th we think something like 10 terawatts of heat, which probably doesn't mean anything to you, but that's about a third of the heat coming out of the mantle is radiogenic decay of these elements. And so on exoplanets, we have no idea how much radiogenic heating those planets could have. They could have double, they could have half, we really don't know. Uh, and this gets back to the composition of these exoplanets. We don't. We're not. Get, we're going to have a hard time getting precise compositions of these exoplanets without getting samples. The games that we try to play are looking at the star that the exoplanet's orbiting, and we try and infer that the stellar composition can be mapped onto the planetary composition in some complex way, which is where planet formation folks um, play play a role in trying to understand how that mapping works from the stellar composition to the planet. Um, there are, it's also possible maybe with James Webb to see the compositions of these atmospheres, these uh, exoplanet atmospheres, which maybe you could use to infer something to do with the interior composition, but then you have to understand, you know, the entire atmospheric, uh, chemistry and how, it, how the atmosphere works over long time scales. So that's a very, really, very hard problem. But we don't know until we go look at these atmospheres really what we're going to see. Well, couldn't you do a deeper analysis of this um, Earth's core or a deeper analysis of our mantle and be able to project, I guess, which exoplanets would have maybe some same factors that could sustain life or, in a sense, keep that balance that we have here? Yeah, yeah. So we have done, I've done some of this and some other folks too, where you just kind of use your basic Earth model and you tweak a couple parameters here and there and you sort of explore, you know, how likely is it that just an average super Earth would have a magnetic field? Um, and it appears that, you know, as to be expected, that, you know, a big, you, you, if you make Earth 10 times more massive and keep everything else the same, composition and so forth, then you get a slightly stronger magnetic field and it's perfectly happy in there for a while. Um, so, what we would, I, I should also mention there's one other observable that could potentially play a big role here, and that's remote detection of exomagnetic fields. So this has not been done yet, but there, there is a proposal, there are proposed pr uh, predictions that you can measure radiation coming from these planetary magnetic fields directly. So it, it, could, it could potentially be used, a way, be used as a way to detect the presence of a planet that you wouldn't otherwise see. Um, but the basic physics are um, these solar wind electrons, this is some other planetary system, come in and get trapped on a planetary magnetic field line and they spin. The electrons get trapped on this magnetic field line and they spin down to the, to the base of the planet. And as they spin down, uh, they emit what's called cyclotron emission. And that's um, a radio emission. So it's in radio frequencies. It's like 10 megahertz or something, 10 to 100 megahertz. Um, so Jupiter's magnetic field was detected this way with a radio telescope in the 1950s here by my department, you know, well before I got here. 
Um, but now, ever since that detection, people have proposed, oh, maybe we can detect magnetic fields of other planets. And so there are ideas to do that, but we need to put some radio large radio telescopes up into space where it's radio quiet to be able to detect these uh, exomagnetic fields. And that would provide us with you know, yet another data point to infer something about what, how these exoplanets operate and how habitable they might be. Have you ever entertained the idea of being able to terraform to make an exoplanet or make one that would be suitable conditions, or is that just too out of the realm of the technology that we have? I, uh, of course, it's way beyond our technology today. Um, I think the challenge, the first challenge would be terraforming Earth into something that is sort of some kind of optimal, habitable place to live. And that that problem will probably go on for generations or centuries. Um, and then maybe in doing that process of working hard to keep the earth habitable for as many people and life forms as possible, we'll learn you know, what this might mean for how to do it on other bodies. Um, but at this point, I mean, I think getting a, a base on the moon would be a nice first step for scientific purposes anyway. Yeah, because I, I think when we look at exoplanets, we, a lot of people always think of like the surface. They never really think of like the deeper inner layer and the way that you were just describing um, in the beginning of our chat um, about how important this kind of balance that's happening beneath us. Um, it brings in a bigger question of like, what other factors are we looking at when it comes to an exoplanet? I mean, if you can find a way to make that same thing happen, which is like it's out of the realm right now with technology wise. But I mean, does that come from? asteroids could that happen from an impact could that throw off that whole magnetic field in a sense as well too you know completely shift the whole lines where you might have something where i'm not saying this is very hypothetical but if you have an asteroid that's on course for earth and we know that there's been asteroids that have been you know something either pulls it in i think it's like mercury is its gravitational field that pulls in jupiter probably jupiter that pulls in it's it's known as our shield in a sense but it, i mean it's why i was so pro planetary defense i'm just worried about like the, an, an asteroid that could hit earth at any moment and you're just magically go on with your life or something um but if if something like that happens could that knock it and create this type of field or create this system that starts lining up this process to create these conditions that could happen i mean that could possibly happen with earth i mean before life was was there something that could have hit and next thing you know you get into like the ideas of like the younger driest impact hypothesis and you get into all these other types of aspects that people out there um hypothesize about these impacts that happen and i mean it brings in a bigger question is like is it all really just luck or is there something that's been that event that specifically happened that caused this giant chain reaction action to where we lead into now yeah i mean certainly we know that giant impacts can cause mass extinctions and so such such events can have massive impacts on life on the surface whether you can go the other way around where you can have a inhabitable planet be hit and knocked into a habitable state i've not heard too much about that i mean i suppose it's it, it is you know plausible that after a large impact, you could something, you know, say a, a giant comet hit Mars and delivered like a huge amount of water or something. And after the planet cooled down from the impact, maybe you've got a bunch of water hanging around in the atmosphere, ice um, environments that are more habitable than Mars is today. But it's probably not a long term habitable state. It's probably, and, and by, you know, my time scales here are millions of years, potentially billions of years. So yeah, maybe you get a habitable niche on a planetary surface for a couple of million years because of a special type of impact. But it's not the kind of long-term habitability, you know, billion year habitability that we think you need to have to evolve like intelligent life like the Earth. Um, and there was something else I was gonna say about something you said in there, but now I've, I've forgotten. Sometimes your questions are so long I give you a lot so you can answer one <laughs> yeah. of them so you don't have okay. to just try and okay. pinpoint them all. But um, when we talk about like ours, for instance, our inside, is it now is it recyclable? Like, is this something that's going to run out or is this just constant thing that constantly refuels itself? Because like when we mentioned earlier about like this event that kind of happened where I'm going to forget. I know it's not imploding. You said it wasn't imploding. But Nucleation. Yeah. yeah, when that event happened, I mean, is that something that is 
that, that it's it's it sounds to me it sounds very intelligent that like it's resetting itself it's setting itself back to a part where it can still keep on this process and keep on going um when it gets to a critical state which makes you kind of think does the earth have resets and that goes down a whole other path some people don't think the earth has resets and then some people do I'm just saying it leads into this other factor where you start wondering if it is this recyclable system, is there a point where it's going to run out or is it just constantly this never ending thing? Are we going to have to worry about this? Maybe not in our lifetimes, maybe not in the next thousand years or so, but later down the line. I'm thinking of the old original Nintendo where after a couple of years, you had to hit the reset button just to, break <laughs> it, time to get it to work. Um, I don't think there are too many of those kinds of events in Earth's history. That's a really unique event especially for the core, it's probably the most important event that happened in the Earth's core. And what's gonna happen over the next like four or 5 billion years is the inner core is gonna grow, 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 grow as the core cools. And eventually the whole core will be solid. And then that'll kill the dynamo. But that's gonna take like billions of years, like 4 billion years, I think I calculated that once until that the whole core becomes solid. Um, and then once, you know, once that happens, then the whole planet's just going to start to cool down, and eventually the planet will just be cold. Uh, at least the interior will, um, and you'll stop. You'll stop having volcanoes, and um, probably most of the tectonic behavior will stop, and so forth. So you're talking about a planet maybe that's 10 billion years old at that point, or something. And the question is, well, what sets that time scale? Why is it 10 billion years? Uh, or maybe it's just maybe it's just five. Or, okay, what what sets that time scale? And that's another complicated question that we think depends on the planetary system. So um, how, what is the radiogenic decay rate? So thorium and uranium have like a billion year decay rate. Potassium is like 700,000, no, 1.2 uh, uh, billion years, I think. So if you have some radiogenic elements that have longer decay rates, maybe they kick in at some point, and they can prevent the core from cooling down too fast. So they could keep the core liquid longer. Um, there's another heat source we haven't mentioned that we think is important for exoplanets and that's tidal heating. So this is directly analogous to the gravitational tides that we feel um, on the earth's oceans from the moon and the sun that drive those di di diurnal tides. Uh, we think on these exoplanets that orbit real close to their stars and have other planets real close to them, like very close, that as they orbit their stars, that they get little gravitational tugs. And those tugs are felt in part on the interior and the rocks. And that friction of tugging the rocks generates heat. And that's known as tidal heating. And the, the biggest example of that heating in the solar system is in Jupiter's moon Io which is continuously tidally heated even today to the point where it is just continuously erupting magma onto the surface, lava. And it's got these hot spots, like 50 erupting volcanoes at any given moment on the surface. And that's entirely driven by tidal heating, not radiogenic heating, not secular cooling. It's really tidal heating. So we think that tidal heating can be important on exoplanets as well. Does that so that plays an effect of like a exoplanet or a planet in general has many moons? Then you're having like a random kind of convection of different pulling from different sides and different angles that throws. Yeah, so the gravitational. Yeah, that's right. The gravitational environment um, for Io is complex. It's in resonance with a couple of its moons, uh, and it's rather small compared to Callisto and Ganymede, or not Ganymede. Um, drawing a blank, the other large one around Jupiter, and they kind of tug Io around. Io just kind of gets moved around and tugged on constantly by Jupiter and these other planets and the sun, of course. And because of that, it maintains a little bit of eccentricity to its orbit. It's not, it doesn't orbit in a perfect circle. And as soon as you move away from it being in a perfect circle, you experience gravitational tides. Uh, that is a time variable gravitational force. And that, that's what can generate the frictional heating in the interior. So you if you take Io and just extrapolate Io to a super Earth orbiting another star, close to another star, and maybe there's a, a hot Jupiter right next to that super Io, you can imagine that planet really get heated up dramatically. And so we also think that tidal heating can be important. You want a little bit of tidal heating maybe, but not too much. 
but it could be another prolonged heat source like the radiogenic heating I mentioned earlier that keeps the planet hotter for longer and maybe keeps it, you know, have it geologically, geophysically habitable for longer. Now, would colonization or some type of method of being able to live on the moon, would that have an overall effect in the long run of like our, our tidal, like heating, for instance? Yes. So that's a, that's tough. We, the, the, the Earth's moon doesn't do a lot of tidal heating in the Earth's interior. It's a very tiny effect. Um, and mostly that's because 80% uh, of that tidal energy is dissipated in the Earth's oceans. So all that gravitational tugging going on um, between the Earth and these other bodies is dissipated as waves in the ocean. Basically, you know, just going to the beach and watching a wave crash, you're dissipating energy. That's gravitational energy that you're sucking out of the moon's orbit effectively, and dissipating in that ocean wave crashing. And because of that, our, our moon is moving slowly away, far away, further away from the Earth. I think it's like a centimeter a year or something. So its orbit is slowly getting further and further away. Um, so maybe you, if you have a liquid ocean, you dissipate most of the gravitational energy there. We don't really know how that's, we don't understand well how that scales in terms of gravitational tidal force and where it dissipates. Um, but yeah, the moon has probably played an, uh, it has played a nice habitable role for keeping the Earth, keeping the, the obliquity, that's the variation of its rotation axis over time, keeping that steady, um, um, and some other orbitable, orbital properties of the Earth are, are assisted by having a large moon around. Now, you mentioned something about um, with volcanoes, for instance, the way I kind of thought of it was like, is our core, like our, if our core is like a boiling pot, and you have these, you know, as water boils, bubbles start to pop. Is that volcanoes? No. Yeah, that's where the analogy breaks down. Because when you see a bubble in a pot of boiling water, that's a that's gas. Um, so that's a phase change from a liquid to a gas because the, the liquid gets too hot, and it turns into a gas then that gas is very low density and wants to rise. And so you do get bubbles um, in, in magma. So beneath a volcano, um, you're melting the rocks down there, they're liquid. And if they, and as they get close enough to the surface, um, all the, the gas that's trapped in that liquid magma can dissolve out of the magma into these, get into these bubbles. And those gas bubbles then come up and can cause eruptions in the surface. Um, and so, but that's not connected to the core in any way. Well, I was looking at like if the core has these random spouts or maybe has like something where you see like a, a high spike or something, and it, 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 would that be a volcano type deal where it would cause some impact on the surface where you would see an abrupt change? I mean, we know plate shift. Um, so I, it, it's happened before. So you start looking at this aspect of like, if you start looking at plate shifts, like, does that have an overall effect in these spikes that start occurring or these start, these changes start to go? I, even if it's like what we see on the surface, I always try and think, well, what's happening deeper down be beneath that? Like with the moon example, we just talked about a second ago, even though it's a small factor of a play into the, the aspect of like, you know, tidal heating, I still worry about it. like what happens if we don't have that small little aspect. Sometimes it's the small person on the dodgeball team that's the strongest. <laughs> yeah, it could be. That's kind of scary though. Uh, that if these tiny little details matter for 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 having intelligent life, but it could be. Um, but getting back to the volcano thing, so let me explain it this way. So Hawaii is sort of the canonical hotspot volcano on Earth. It's huge, right? It's the, the Pacific Ocean is very deep, and right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you have a huge volcano that comes all the way up to the surface and has these huge mountains, mountains so high that they put telescopes on it, and there's snow up there, right? It's crazy. Um, now, Hawaii is a hot spot in the sense that there is a hot plume burning the hole through the crust beneath the Hawaiian uh, volcanoes, and it's been burning a hole through the crust there for probably 80 million years. And you can see that the Pacific plate has got these burn scars effectively going all the way up the Pacific, um, up towards Siberia. And that's called the Hawaiian, um, the Hawaiian track. And there's a track of, of underwater volcanoes that go all, goes all the way up there. 
Um, and then thinking about how deep it goes, the Hawaiian heat source is all the way down in the base of the mantle, right above the core. So we think there's a hot, for some reason, there's a hot fluid or a chemically buoyant fluid there above the core, sitting on the top of the core at the base of the mantle, feeding this, continuously feeding this hot plume of material that's feeding the volcanic, the Hawaiian hotspots on the Earth's surface. Um, now that the Hawaiian hotspot, as I said, is quite old, and we don't think it is fed in any way by the core, okay, the mantle pretty much does its own convective motions and cooling on its own. It doesn't really feel the core very much. But the core, as I said earlier, in, is influenced heavily by the mantle. So right beneath that Hawaiian uh, plume source, um, you could be Inter, in, interfer, uh, influencing how the core convex beneath that region. The core could be convecting less, sl less quickly beneath it or more quickly depending on that cooling rate above it. Um, so I think that's the clearest way to explain how you can have like across the mantle, a thermal connection all the way across the mantle, but it doesn't penetrate. It's not like the mantle material doesn't penetrate into the core. It's just a cooling to heat transfer across the boundary there. It's separate in its own. Yes. Um, when we talk about the magnetic field now, is is there like any abrupt changes like that you could I, besides the one we mentioned earlier where it, I'm going to forget. I'm not even going to say the name of it. And don't 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 say it. You know what it is. It's nucleotide. The, the thing <laughs> Nucleus. I can't. I don't know why that one word is not sticking in my head. But besides that occurrence, has there been anything of like past 100, 200 years where you've just noticed like the line maybe go up a small, very, very minuscule bit? and maybe just elevate or change in a sense because if we talk about like the evolution of life in a sense and if this does have a factor in playing into the evolution of life you start wondering if the, the frequency of it changes just a small dramatic hair would you start seeing life evolve in a different sense would it speed up would it slow down yeah, yeah people have been looking in the magnetic record to correlate the magnetic record with evolutionary events for decades like ever since we started looking at magnetic records and evolutionary records back in the 50s and 60s. Um, people have been looking for these things. And there are ideas out there, but it's never really taken off as a direct connection between the two, for whatever reason. Um, I should also say that on a shorter time scale, so the inner core nucleation event we're talking about half a billion years ago, so that's a long time ago. But on shorter time scales, the Earth's magnetic field varies its intensity so it can get stronger and weaker. And on a 100,000 year time scale, so every 250,000 years, that's a quarter of a million years, the Earth's magnetic field uh, reverses its polarity. So what we think of now as the North Pole, North Magnetic Pole, which is coincident with the North Geographic Pole or close to it, um, would reverse. And so you'd have the Southern magnetic pole at the North rotation pole and so forth. So all your compasses would flip. So that's a magnetic reversal. And we have documented evidence of thousands of magnetic reversals over the last billion, two billion years. Um, they, the, the magnetic field does not reverse regularly. It's not like a clock or anything. It's much more chaotic. It's kind of like looking at weather um, where some years you have uh, you know, um, a heat wave or a lot of hurricanes and some years you don't because it's a very, the, the climate, like, like the climate system, the Earth's core is a very complex, turbulent fluid system um, that is, is very hard to predict over long time scales. But needless, needless to say, the, the Earth's magnetic field reverses about four times every million years. And even that reversal frequency modulates uh, over long time scale. So if you go back 80 million years, there were no reversals for 4 million, 40 million years. So we had a period in the, in the, in the uh, Cretaceous between 100 million, 120 million years ago and 80 million years ago where there were no reversals effectively, maybe some local ones. Um, that's called the supercron, the Cretaceous normal supercron. And then after that, after 80 million years ago, we started, the magnetic field started to reverse again. It's picked up. And now we're sort of at a, the peak of its reversal rate. And we expect it to kind of come back down again. And we think that that modulation is determined by the mantle cooling rate, as I said. So the mantle is probably cooling a little faster today than it did 80 million years ago. 
um, just because the mantle convection currents are that slow. You just sort of get a mantle convection turnover every 50, 80, 80 million years. It's very slow. Now, is there any like correlation or uh, this might be a long walk for a short drink of water, I believe the term is, don't quote me on that. Um, but like human impact, is that having any massive scale that's noticeable on just everything that's going on? Like, are we speeding up the clock in a sense when it comes to like, maybe not a polar shift or anything of that sort, but just messing with the earth's core or throwing it out of whack in a sense? Um, I don't think we are. I think it'd be very hard for humans to influence the core just because the mantle is such a mass, such a, has such a massive thermal inertia, it's very hard to change. You know, I got asked a question once, does, will climate change affect the core? And my immediate response is no. I mean, it depends what scale of climate change we're talking about. If the earth becomes Venus, becomes like 700 degrees at the surface, then okay, maybe. But a de couple degrees Celsius, uh, is not going to influence the cooling rate of the of the deep interior. It's just not. It's just not a big enough effect. Um, but you know, yeah. So I, I don't think humans can affect the magnetic field. And I forget the other half of your question. Sorry, I forgot it too. Uh, I'm writing these things down. Uh, but let's take it to, is there anything that you feel like that maybe you're more aware of or more fearful of in the next coming, at least from your understanding and from your work? Yeah. So now I remember what we were going to, what I was going to say is that the magnetic field does change on slower time scales. So um, every couple of years, the, the world magnetic map, which is literally just a map of where the magnetic field lines are over the earth's surface gets they have to redo that map every five or 10 years because the magnetic field is moving slowly. It's becoming, you know, the dipole's shifting a little bit this way or that way, or the South Atlantic anomalies moving east or west or something, or the whole field's getting weaker over Siberia or something. So you might've heard a couple of years ago, there was a big shift, not, not rapid, but a, you know, a slow five-year shift that was significant enough that they had to redo these aviation maps um, five years earlier than they normally do. Um, and there are magnetic events called geomagnetic jerks that are like on the order of a couple months, a couple years. That's about the fastest event you see um, for the magnetic field. So it's a pretty slow process. And then the reversal process itself, which is the most dramatic thing it does, takes about a thousand years, one to five thousand years for that reversal process to start and then finish. So for that pole, the magnetic pole to flip into the other hemisphere. So you're talking about a 5,000 year timeline. So all the birds and fish that use magnetic field lines like compasses to guide them in their migrations will have plenty of time to recalibrate, you know, where those magnetic field lines are with respect to where they ever, wherever they need to go. And so I expect that, you know, 5,000, if, if there's, if the magnetic field is undergoing a reversal now or at the beginning of one, then a thousand years from now, you know, humans will have time to adapt, to move our satellites, to construct the kind of whatever kind of shielding we need to have, or put out the kind of weather forecasts we need to have to certain parts of the globe to kind of deal with that problem. I don't think that's, that's not like a climate change scale problem, you know, that's a much longer term thing what, we'd have to deal with. What about something like the Carrington event? The Carrington event, was that a meteorite impact? Um, I don't think it was a meteorite impact. All I remember is that there was like enough electricity in the air that people were talking about using their cell phones or using their walkie talkies without it being plugged into anything. This was a solar event, okay. a massive solar flare. Yeah. So that has to spike change in the magnetic field. I'm just saying that's a, well, it does, yeah. So um, if you get a big solar flare, that's basically a big burst of hot electrons and protons coming off the sun. And when they reach the earth, some of that radiation will get down into the magnetosphere of the earth and down to the surface. And it'll, it'll create aurora um, at low latitudes. It could interfere with our electromagnetic environment. So like all those nice radio waves we rely on um, for our Wi-Fi and our cell phone service and all that stuff could be interfered with by a solar event. And I think that's much more likely that 
that the sun has a big solar event, maybe every couple hundred years, you know, there's a big solar event um, that can influence us. And we don't, we, we don't have good enough records or good enough magnetic recorders for a long enough time to really know the statistics of those events. How likely are they? How often do they occur? Kind of like earthquakes, right? It's like, you know, they're dangerous and you want to be prepared, but you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's another possible hazard. Kind of like a, they say there's like an earthquake or something that's going to come in like from now to like the next 10 million years or something like that. That's going to completely change the face of the planet. Do you know anything about that? Is that real or is that just conspiracy talk? I haven't heard that one, but I know that places like the Pacific Northwest and, and the, you know, in California that, you know, oh, if, if you look over like a thousand years, there's a, a very, very high probability they'll have a catastrophic earthquake. Like a 10. Uh, yeah, like a 10. So catastrophic in the sense that like, it will be massive and it will be highly disruptive and there'll be casualties and stuff like that. And so that's why that those parts of the world do put a significant amount of resources into monitoring and research uh, and preparedness, and, you know, Japan's probably got the best um, preparedness program in the world. I just remember Robin Williams joke when he was like, I was in a 4.5 and that was like a grab your chest, pray to God moment. And he goes, and that was a 4.5. Wait for the big one. He was like, that was what? What's a big one? Like, that's going to change the whole face of the planet. But also with that, that I heard Yellowstone. What is that a, a real fear in like my lifetime, my kid's lifetime, next lifetime? Or is that just something that could be from randomly just implode on itself and have or have this massive explosion that completely changes because i feel like that has to play a factor in with magnetic fields as well too mostly if you look at the magnetic field i believe that any maybe abrupt change to it or something that could happen like a solar flare incident or something because if you look at like the earth being made of metals or have metals inside of it a solar flare happens it's going to conduct that and it's going to go right into our core if i'm not mistaken no it's not gonna because because the mantle is not a good metal is not a good conductor of electricity. So we've got this big rocky shield between between space and the iron core. So there's very little electromagnetic interaction between the two. I mean, the only electromagnetic interaction is up in the magnetosphere where the Earth's magnetic field penetrates into space. But that doesn't play a big role in the interior of the core. That's just a space phenomenon, basically. Um, so with Yellowstone, this is getting outside of my knowledge. You should talk to one of my volcanology colleagues about this. They'll know much more. But yes, Yellowstone sits under on, on a super volcano, a super volcano. You know, something akin to the size of Hawaii, perhaps that's extinct or at least dormant. My impression of the time scale for the resurgence of such a, a large, you know, volcano would be long thousands, millions of years, perhaps, um, before you'd actually see a resurgence. Sometimes I show up to work 20 minutes early. So uh, how long are we talking? That's what I'm saying is like, I don't, when we say like, there's know. like this I long know. period, I just go like, I mean, uh, what are we estimating? Not tomorrow. Yeah, we're not tomorrow. We're talking thousands of years, millions of years. Yeah, not in a human lifetime. Um, but it's again, that's not a question. You should talk to somebody who actually monitors volcanoes and says because we you know there are people that actually go to vol active volcanoes and set up equipment to monitor to see what is going on um, so that we can better predict so we can better monitor and tell people like that are on vacation in italy like get off this island <laughs> it is very likelihood of, of erupting right um so that's a sort of a hazard control that's an aspect of geophysics called hazard mitigation and there's going to be someone that's like, I've lived on this island 60 something years and not once has anything you said ever came true. So I'm not leaving. And that's when it happens. That's when it happens. Same um, with hurricanes, right? Well, when it comes to like animals, for instance, we mentioned like migration patterns or things that go off kind of like the magnetic field of like the earth, for instance, be able to with direction if it's going to, you know, migrate somewhere. Have, can you notice a change or a mess up in our field? through one of these animals that use these migration patterns or have these types of techniques that, that you know, like geese, for instance, you know, when they migrate, um, birds, when they fly, they use this type of sense of, I'm going to butcher it, but type of magnetic kind of compassing to be able to go to where, you know, fly in a V, that's all I know. 
Wine of the Year. I've not heard of that. I've not heard of, you know, people being informed by the, the magnetic receptors of animals as to changes going on in the Earth's magnetic field. I mean, mainly because the Earth's magnetic field changes so slowly that none of us life forms really perceive that change. I, they would, I, right? They would. Um, no, they, these magnetic changes are over the course of years. So they're not, even the oldest sea turtle is, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't care if the magnetic field is changing by a millionth of a degree every year or something. You know what I mean? He'll just adjust and he won't even notice. Um, but um, I bet if you go and look in the history books that back when we didn't understand solar flares and stuff like that, I bet, I bet solar flares were often first noticed by animals kind of going crazy because especially like birds, they notice something's wrong in the atmosphere um, or perhaps animals with magnetoreceptors like fish or whatever. Um, I mean, a lot of mammals have magnetoreceptors so they can tell if there's a, 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 a perturbation in the magnetic field. You know, there is, there is also, we didn't talk about this, but there's daily magnetic cycles in the atmosphere that are not caused at all by what's going on in the core that have to do with just the daily turning of the earth facing the sun and the radiation we get from the sun causing uh, cycles of radiation going on in the atmosphere. Um, so we get fluctuations in the electric field on the Earth's surface by, by you know, twice a day, just kind of like the gravitational tides. And so um, if you have a solar event come in and disrupt those normal cycles, then perhaps these birds that are really sensitive to the magnetic field would be the first to notice. And so maybe there's some historical record of that um, being observed. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know. I mean, we just recently had, I think it was like six, seven months ago, we had a bunch of solar flares happening. Like I know Arizona was dealing with a, a lot of power issues. And um, I mean, it's something that I think a lot of people just kind of go, well, my Wi-Fi is not going to work today. But I'm like, it doesn't that play something else. Like, it's just more fascinating to me to look at like an aspect of like, what else is it doing? Not just to our technology that we use, but to our planet in a sense. Like, I bet it's not just affecting our Wi-Fi. It's probably affecting something else out there that we're not, maybe it's, we're not sensitive to, we, we don't notice it as much as something else that might be on a different frequency notices it. It could be. I mean, I, this is again, outside of my wheelhouse, so I don't know. That's why we're called out of the it, blank. We speculate. Okay. We, we are <laughs> speculating at this point. Um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, in modern day, we're so, we're so reliant on electromagnetic radiation and radio waves to do so much that a disruption there you know, could have a big impact on like, you know, global markets and communication and stuff like that. Um, in terms of like other aspects of the earth, like, I don't know, this is more for like a climate scientist, but like can a large solar storm, magnetic storm influence the climate? You know, I don't know. Can a, if the magnetic field reverses, can that influence the climate in terms of like storms and weather and stuff like that? And I just don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure. We really do know the answer to that. It's pretty complicated. I know it's not a first order effect. It's not like we know climbing CO2 increases the greenhouse effect, right? And injects energy into the atmosphere. Like we know that. That's a little bit easier to understand. But how the magnetic environment influences the climate and the surface is much more subtle and more complicated. Well, which has a bigger impact, our environment or us when it comes to our magnetic field? Um, well, just be, I only ask that because the possibility that this thing might have helped with like the creation of life in a sense, even if no matter how small of a factor it might have played. I mean, if you look at like an a giant abrupt change that could happen, would you see a giant abrupt change more in the environment or would you see more of an abrupt change happen in people? Like, because when I first came across that article you wrote about like the magnetic field and its evolution, I start going, if this is like something like, oh, you kind of like put a little safety blanket on top of me when you were like, well, it doesn't have this like giant sporadic thing that affects us that bad. My mind, when I read that, I was like, what I was thinking was that like some giant magnetic field shift could happen and humans next thing you know, can read each other's minds and stuff. I don't know. That's where my <laughs> brain just went. Yeah. Yeah. That's sweet. Um, so we do not have, we do not have magnetoreceptors. I, should, I shouldn't say that we have dormant 
magnetoreceptors in our brain. So people have done lots of experiments of, of humans in magnetically shielded rooms ex exposed to magnetic fields to see if they have any kind of uh, ability to um, you know, orient themselves with the magnetic field. And so far for humans, it's not been, um, I should say, it's not been you know, comprehensively proven. There are some speculations out there that there could be some, some active magnetoreceptors, but in other mammals like um, cows, for example, um, they have active magnetoreceptors that they don't appear to be using for any purpose. But if you do a test on them, like you can get them to follow a magnetic field line. Um, so at some point, life evolved to use this ambient magnetic field for some purpose. We don't exactly know why. There are these magnetotactic bacteria, these tiny little worms that build up these strings of iron, uh, pieces of iron sort of in their tail inside of them. And they use that to orient themselves to, with magnetic field lines, presumably to find food and stuff and to escape predators. And they're, they're pretty old organisms. So this magnet, magnetoreceptor feature goes back pretty far in evolution. But um, to be honest, I think that if we had a big solar event that humans would be more influenced in our like cultural, in a cultural way, um, which would then influence us like in a physical, biological way. It's not like, it's not like we're gonna feel the magnetic field lines changing, but if all electricity and cell phone service goes down, you know, for a month or something, we're talking, we have a big problem on our hands that the cows in the field, you know, it's not going to affect them as much. I think that answers your question. It does. Um, it, because um, like, I'm just, there are hypotheticals. Yeah, it's a hard question. question. <laughs> it's it, a really hard question. Yeah, questions I have only because um, it's fascinating. I mean, you start learning a lot more about this stuff and you definitely put stuff in a little bit more of sciencey terms, but I think it, is interesting because you start realizing how fascinating our earth is. Um, and I don't think the general public, like I said, in the beginning of this show, I don't think we really get the full breakdown of how important and how interesting it actually is from a seventh grade or eighth grade science class. They just don't do a very good job at teaching it. There seems to be a giant push in society to want to leave this planet rather than try and focus on the information that it holds. Kind of like with our minds, there's more influence in technology than trying to understand the one thing that's inside of our head, or we still don't understand the term consciousness. Like people think we have it figured out, but we don't. And it's an area that should be looked at again. Yeah, you know, just on, on the colonizing example, um, and maybe this is a broader metaphor for what you're trying to say, but it's much easier to look up into space and see, you can see, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of light years, you know, light coming from incredible distances. When you look down, you can see like a couple meters. Now the, first, the, further, the furthest humans have ever dug into the earth is like, five kilometers or something. That's like the deepest we've gone um, into the crust with a drill. You know, we have samples obviously from much deeper, but actual human technology has only gone a couple kilometers deep. So then that just gives you a sense of how hard it is to directly probe Earth's deep interior. Most of what we know about the interior comes from um, earthquakes measuring seismic waves. Um, as one magnetic field changing is two, and then uh, geology and geochemistry. It's like, what, what are the rocks doing on Earth's surface? Um, and so they're all sort of indirect measurements, whereas an astronomer goes to a telescope and looks at whatever they're looking at. Maybe they're in some frequency window and it's not, a, it's not an image, but they're still looking directly at it. And so that's one reason why I think the public mind is so drawn to space science and why it's maybe taught a little bit more commonly than earth science because earth especially in the interior of the earth is just really hard to study and most people are just like oh it's too hard you know there's no pretty picture we don't have any pretty pictures of the core to show you zero you know i've never seen what the core looks like i think about it every day all day but i have no idea what it looks like um and that's a big that's a big uh, obstacle when it comes to motivating the public to get interested. So 
Like there's no pretty picture. I'll, I'll create a nice movie, animated movie from one of my simulations, dynamo simulations. They look great. They look beautiful, but you know, they're simulations. They're in false color. They're, um, they're very idealized, right? Um, and I guess, and obviously the other reason why people are so fascinated with space is that is the exploration part of it. I mean, I don't have to explain this to you, but just people are motivated to explore and you know, colonize the next, the next great thing and um, be, um, you know, trailblazers and that kind of thing. Do you think that this is relatively new in like the past 100, 200 years that people have kind of lost focus on the earth a little bit and focus more towards the outer part of space? Because I mean, it might be a different example or a different field, but I think it's also the cusp of kind of understanding um, at least a different direction we could have headed, which was the invention of dowsing rods. Now, whether you want to consider those accurate or you want to consider those even useful at all, but it's this idea of using two rods to detect like water in the earth. I'm like, it seems like back then there was a little bit more of a focus to understand our planet and how it works like figure out the tips and tricks to be able to you know help out in a certain situation if you need it and it seems like now we've kind of went in a whole different direction i mean i guess you know that studying both the earth interior and space go back as far as human history right um space has always been like I said, it's so much more accessible that it's used for navigation. It's used for ceremonial purposes, right? Um, it's influenced art and, and stuff like that. Earth's interior is not quite as useful in a way, sort of utilitarian in the sense that, um, I mean, maybe the magnetic field, people use that to navigate with, um, but that's about, the, that's about it. And I think um, it's been in the last hundred years or so where the um, our understanding of how the earth works has really exploded because of technology that we've invented, um, basically to, to probe the earth, you know, seismometers, uh, magnetic field measuring devices, um, tech, laboratory techniques for, for looking at tiny little rocks and so forth. Um, and that, you know, it's kind of spearheaded by World War II. We invented a lot of technology. And that's where, that's really when geophysics started, was like in the 40s and the 50s. We really started to understand how the, the plate tectonics is operating. And, you know, the core is liquid and it's generating a magnetic field and so forth. But astronomy, you know, I don't know. Astronomy goes back, you know, obviously to Kepler and Newton and these, these guys of hundreds of years ago. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So um, I would actually say that geophysics is a much, you know, geophysics is a, is a part of earth science, but geophysics is a much younger field um, than astronomy. And astronomy's really always had a, a, the upper hold, I think, in the public awareness and its, and its popularity, you know. Well, we'll change the tides one day. <laughs> this podcast though, right? <laughs> yeah, if only I had that power. Um, <laughs> But Peter, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, man. Is there a place where people can find any of your links? Yeah, go to Carnegie Science, Earth and Planets Lab. Uh, you can find me there and I update my website pretty regularly uh, and feel free to shoot me an email. I've got videos up there of talks I've given if you wanna give a, get a full form uh, experience of how magnetic fields work. Uh, and it's a pleasure talking to you too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.